Well, I will do. Are, can you hear me okay in the back? I sure. have a terrible cold, so I apologize in advance for delivering this speech with a terrible voice. And um, right, this is this may be even better, right? Yeah, I can hear it myself now because I have a cold. My ears are as well sort of you know, disturbed. So please interrupt me if you can't hear me. I will do just wave. And thank you for delivering a speech today. I will try to combine some of my responses to what we have heard before today. But let me start my talk with an example. Last year, a, a friend of mine who has a 16-year-old daughter, her daughter came home announcing that she wanted to become a vegan. Because she said, and I quote, eating meat causes as much cancer as smoking cigarettes. And when my friend asked her daughter for the source of her sudden persuasion, she referred to the World Health Organization, which would have been quoted in What the Health, which is the documentary you see on this little screen here, and that is a Netflix documentary mailed to her via her Facebook account by her girlfriends. And all of these friends, she said, she added, all of these friends are going to be vegan. So my friend and her daughter, they both sat down to watch What the Health to check a few so-called so facts in this documentary. And although this documentary indeed referred to some of the WHO reports, it was soon clear that it also contains a variety of half-truths and distortions and manipulations and just outright nonsense. So I think this mother-daughter scene, I don't know how many of you have children in a teenage, do you have teenage children, how many of you? Not that many, but those of you who do, they will certainly recognize this scene. And it actually touches, this one scene touches upon a very important issue. How can a 16-year-old learn to distinguish reliable sources in an online media landscape that inundates her with information and opinions? That is a really basic question. Now, over the past few years, we have encountered the problem of fake news and disinformation on the internet. But scientific disinformation is a special category, a special case that I think deserves due attention. There are countless examples, ranging from the very subtle to the very blatant that, you know, it, I have no time to go into today. But here, for instance, there, I, I'm going to show you a few, a few examples that make me laugh the most, but take this example for instance. It's, it's about the, vac the vaccine denial debate where denials, deniers claim there have been zero US measles deaths in 10 years, but over 100 measles vaccine, vaccine deaths reported. Or take this one, and I like this particular, although it's in Dutch, I, I will translate it for you. Um, this is a nice example of uh, scientific misinformation. It's a report claiming that vaccines stimulate homosexual feelings in children. <laughs> and you may not be familiar with, the, uh, well, you may be familiar with the climate change uh, movement, you know, climate change deniers, but you may have been less, you may be less familiar with the flat earthers. And those are advocates who claim to have evidence that our planet more or less looks like a pancake. So just in case you didn't know this kind of, you know, evidence or this kind of information, this is what children encounter on the internet. Now, my main concern here this afternoon is how can trust in expertise be anchored in a, a digital society? For many citizens, for students, for youngsters, it has become increasingly harder to assess information and separate scientifically developed knowledge from humbug. And over the last year, much has been said about this multi-layered problem of fake news, but less has been said about a specific case of scientific disinformation, which I think really rewards our attention. What's at stake here is not just eroding trust in scientists who produce knowledge, or in journalists and citizens who disseminate that knowledge through media. The stakes are actually much higher than that. For the problem I discuss here this afternoon pertains to the complex ways in which trust is secured and anchored in our digital society. Over the past decades, the specific issue of trust in science has received due attention. 
And as the president of the Dutch Royal Academy over the past three years, I've you know, been involved in many reports on this specific issue. This is a report that was published in 2013, and that was an advisory report titled literally Trust in Science, which argues that trust is based on four pillars, and you see them here. Of course, integrity, transparency, independence, and accountability. Of course, scientists or scholars, they're no individual arbiters of truth. We trust their judgment because that judgment is embedded in institutional processes and anchored by checks and balances that we have made transparent and to which academics can be held accountable. Research and discussion have often led in our ac academic world to consensus. You know, the planet Earth is more or less round. The ice caps on the North Pole decreased rapidly in the past decade. And smoking tobacco raises chances of contracting lung cancer. Now, many of, these many of our policy decisions are grounding in trusting scientific expertise. When after decades of scientific debate, there's a 97% consensus among climate experts on human-induced causes of melting ice caps on the North Pole, of course, this justifies uh, a comprehensive climate agreement. And we're now, you know, pretty much agreeing in our societies on the danger of smoking by implementing um, uh, policies for non-smoking in public areas. Of course, there are many other kinds of subjects on which there is no consensus yet, or simply no consensus, or where research results are preliminary preliminary or at best tentative. So this creates, of course, a sense of uncertainty. But of course, you all know, without room for exploration, without discussion, without experiments, there would be no new knowledge. So striving for what we call common ground is a profound value in democratic societies. And establishing trust and expertise <coughs> is a pillar of such societies. Now, we've been discussing this book on and off again, you know, over the past two days. So, I will return to that. Of course, there is nothing wrong with healthy distrust vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, some prevailing view. On the contrary, we do need critical assessments, constantly. However, in recent years, the opinions of ordinary citizens seem to carry as much weight as the findings of experts. And according to this American historian, Tom Nichols, whom we have seen before in a talk before today, this rendering of all opinions and judgments interchangeable will ultimately lead to what he calls the death of expertise. Now, frankly, I think Nichols' conclusion is rather overstated, but it makes you indeed wonder why scientific expertise is struggling so much particularly in the age of digital media. And that's what I would like to focus on from now. So to raise that question, we actually need to ask two questions. What do we expect from more or less traditional media when it comes to communicating scientific results and weighing expertise versus opinions in public debates? And the other question is, what has changed since the emergence of the internet and what has become the role, especially of social media, in this process? Now, let me start with the first and deal very briefly with that. But it is perhaps no coincidence that trust in media as a societal institution rests on the same pillars as trust in science, integrity, transparency, independence, and accountability. And just like science, traditional media tend to rely on a system of institutional checks and balances, which is pretty much organized control that is crucial for embedding trust in media in our societies. Now, for instance, um, by weighing a public debate's facts and opinions side by side, or by contrasting them to other facts or views, by journalists presenting outcomes based on rationally sound arguments, there are a number of these checks and balances that journalists have actually built into their inter institutional procedures. But over the past few years, well, actually, you know, first two decades, but especially the last two years, the rapid rise of online and social media 
created a new dynamic between citizens and institutions. And by inst those institutions, I mean, of course, science and media. And the focus of public debate shifted from traditional media to online media, and particularly social media such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and thousands, don't forget the thousands and thousands of network blogs. Now, along with this media transformation, one can also perceive a political shift, especially since 2016, we can, we can see that the scientific discourse of logical reasoning and rational evidence of what I would call common ground and common sense has increasingly met with attacks from various sides. And these two developments have seriously shaken the institutional pillars of trust both in science and in media. Now, to explain this phenomenon and to elaborate on it, some refer to Actually, for explanation, some refer to it to technological arguments, while others point to user behavior, which is just as important. And again, others, they refer to an overall transformation of the public debate, you know, more like a, a social or societal transformation. And there's many, many more other transformations, but I will concentrate on these three and briefly elaborate on them. First, the technological argument. Of course, the arrival of the internet would have changed the relationship between expert and layperson. After all, every citizen or organization can now generate, publish, and disseminate information. In fact, all content has become, become equal on the internet, while context is increasingly absent as a marker. Now, the digital chan channels for spreading knowledge often give users little basis as to who says what in which context and based on what authority or expertise. And we refer to this phenomenon uh, uh, as context collapse. See, for instance, this example about vaccine resistors. The message that you see on the screen carries all the outer features of a trustworthy scientific source. And yet, it is very difficult to evaluate this source's so-called truthfulness, independence, and especially accuracy due to a lack of context. A second explanation for the undermining of trust in science and media requires us to look at the behavior of human users of social media. And this is a very recent study, I think it was published in March in Science, uh, which revealed that and this was in the context of fake news, by the way, but it revealed that social media users pay more attention to misinformation than they do to true, so-called true items. And moreover, many users let themselves be led by their prior knowledge or prejudice in assessing the value of a message. So it's a very interesting piece of research. If you're interested in it, you can look it up. And it was very broadly covered in the so-called serious news media, mainstream new news media. Now, we generally refer to this type of phenomenon as confirmation bias. It's a very broad term, but it applies to this situation. Social media actually take you know, a lot of advantage of this by giving individual users exactly the kind of information to which they are receptive. Platforms, social media platforms, generate more clicks and hence more attention and of course make more money. Since the Cambridge Analytical scandal, we know how many detailed information, which we call data points, tech companies can collect on every individual user. But there's also a major role here for the human friends who forwards the message. As we saw in the, the example, my first example of the documentary, What the Health, Facebook friends were central in disseminating certain information on veganism through social media. You know, my, that's where my daughter's friend got all the information from, from her friends. And this specific process of electronic peer pressure particularly impacts teenagers and young adults much more than, you know, actually, you know, people 25 years and older. Sorry to sort of, you know, for this for my truth, but a Third explanation for the decline of trust and expertise pertains to forces who deliberately organize distrust via, via uh, blogs and social media. And 
I actually started to call this phenomenon polarization push. A recent example of this, this was just a few weeks ago in, you know, all over the news, is climate change deniers claiming that polar bear populations do not at all decline as a result of climate change. Interesting. But their strategy was, all, uh, was even more interesting. Their strategy was to widely and rapidly disseminate a single disputable source in an effort to discredit all climate change. So, for many scientists and scholars, such deliberate polariz uh, uh, polarizing efforts, they come as a shock, understandably, because they're all nursed in a scientific culture marked by careful hypothesis and nuanced logic, you know, argumentative reasoning. And now suddenly they find themselves, they find that they have to defend themselves in an online world where all opinions are considered equal, where opinions are more profitable than facts, where one-liners do better than logical argument, and where polarization prevails over common ground and common sense. In an online society, institutions of science and media are undercut constantly by a new dynamic of online disinformation that forces these institutions to reflect more fundamentally on the new meaning of trust. Now, all of us, you know, we're currently in a transitional phase in which public institutions have to reinvent themselves in order to take root in a new and yet very soggy terrain of big data, an unknown terrain of platforms and of algorithms. But the pillars of institutional trust, which I showed you in the beginning, integrity, transparency, autonomy and accountability, they will perhaps paradoxically become even more important in the future. Well, we can no longer, as scientists, as scholars, we can no longer rely on self-evident authority. We can no longer trust, you know, we're no longer, does trust is trust-based and legitimated by institutional status, as, you know, it was for a while ago, as we just heard from Antonio. Um, we're no longer, you know, you can no longer just, you know, point at people, say, hey, dude, that is a card-carrying member of the academy, he or she should be trusted. But institutions at the same time, universities as well as academies, as well as media, by the way, and, but I'll focus on the first, institutions need to adapt to the demands of the 21st century. They cannot do without. So, I'll come back to the idea, not of big data, but of open data and open science. How will they adapt? That is a really important question. And it's impossible for me to inscribe this in detail in just, you know, 20 minutes, 20 minutes that I got allotted. But most importantly, I think academics, perhaps counterintuitively, but they need to become even more transparent, more open and more public than ever before. Researchers are explicitly urged to make their work accessible, but also to clarify their methods of data processing and interpretation. Open data implies the opening up of databases and sources for fellow experts, so they are, they are able to verify and replicate studies, as they always did, and some disciplines do really well, as we heard yesterday in our workshop. But we also need to up you need to open up these findings to interpretation. And this is, of course, not even enough. Open science efforts will require inventiveness and, uh, Malena, critical awareness, as you just pointed out, on the part of researchers. They simply have to deal with the underlying complexities of big data, the morality of algorithms, and particularly the contextualization. And this, of course, perfectly fits in with what Milena and Antonia were just arguing. In short, researchers have no choice. Without transparency, without openness, control on scientific integrity is simply impossible. But then there's this other side, of course, that we have encountered repeatedly. Transparency, transparency and open source, open science, makes scientific experts even more, well, more accountable, but also renders them more vulnerable to attacks, you know, from, any, from anywhere. And some academics have bravely taken on the struggle by systematically refuting deceitful stories and outright fabrication. Some of my colleagues are constantly putting, you know, across counter-narratives. 
and constantly, in fact, you know, doing this sort of fact-checking that, like in fake news, we need, a, to some extent, a fake science. But however laudable their efforts, I think it's ultimately undoable for scientists to fact-check all internet hypes. They would not be able to do their actual job anymore if they were constantly, you know, fact-checking. And this is why scholars are working hard to develop new online tools for assessing the reliability of sources. I have many colleagues, you know, who are actually working on uh, just that. Also helping news media and journalists, uh, people help to check facts, but they also do that, that for research. And these attempts are, uh, are part of a concerted effort of academics to reinvent themselves in response to our evolving digital world. In that effort, I think the support of politicians, of policymakers, and citizens is absolutely indispensable. Now, over the past two years, it became clear that such support for science and research can no longer be taken for granted in countries worldwide, not even within the West, not even within the United States of America. And to underscore their concern about this development, scientists and citizens took to the streets in over 600 cities worldwide to join a march for science on April 22nd last year. This march, by the way, was not about funding. A lot of people thought it was about funding. It was not. It was actually about asking the world to support their institutional grounding in trust and expertise while the world goes through political, technological, and then ecological transformation. Indeed, as scholars, as scientists, as educators, we find ourselves in the middle of a transition and we're expected to help shape that future. And this brings me back to the story of my friend's daughter and the question it raised. How can a 16-year-old learn to distinguish legitimate sources from nonsense in a confusing media landscape? Now, one answer sounds easy, but it's very difficult and very important. And that answer is we really need to invest in education. Even though it's not a panacea, we have to invest in it on all levels. You know, from the primary schools, I just heard this gentleman in the back asking that question. Yes, we have to go all the way from primary schools to university and beyond and graduate schools. Um, students attending schools and universities will have to learn in old and new ways when expertise is trustworthy, and particularly when it's not. So how to make independent judgments and how to evaluate context that you've never learned from you know, a different, um, more paper-like publishing background. Now, this mission to bolster trust and expertise will have to be pursued at all educational levels and should be prioritized, I think, on the agendas of universities of academies, of science councils in the years to come. Indeed, a digital society cannot function properly without open and public institutions. But this assumes that those who run the institutions actively engage in shaping the online dynamic of which they are inevitably part. So to sustain common ground and common sense as a basis of our digital society, we need to ensure that science and education continue to exist as a common good. Now, a democratic society means a society in which all people are equal, but not all expressions are equally true. It is a society in which universities offer ample room for students to express you know, and launch different opinions, but also to discover common ground and common interests. It is a society in which students can find data and information along with the wisdom needed to evaluate knowledge claims. After all, we will soon have to rely on trusting our children's expertise for shaping society in new ways. And that is why it is so crucial to reflect on how we can effectively organize a democratic digital society in which trust and expertise is anchored in old standards but wrapped in new mechanisms. Thank you very much for your attention.